That's funny because we did too. That's fantastic. Oh, we didn't even get that far. Absolutely. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Happy Monday. And welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips. This is me, your host, Anne, with disembodied voice, Justin, ready for your Monday morning chill stream involving plaid and not drinking whiskey, even though sometimes plaid drives us to want to. <laughs> Hello, everybody. How you doing? Everybody's here. Hi. Hi. Awesome hi. I'm just going to go over to the Highland and do it. Just so you guys don't have to stare at my morning face. Morning face. Oh, Monday. Monday morning face. Oh, yeah, right that, like that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, indeed. Good morning, Reaper fam. How y'all doing? How was your weekend? And I'm going to get my palette over here. We're going to talk a bit about what I'm going to do back here. I think I was using cat's eye and using white underneath. And we started with void blue. So let's grab those colors. Do I use cat's eye or naga? Hmm. It's one of those moments where I'm just like, I don't know. I don't use cat's eye enough to recognize, to recognize it. That's on site. But I will look. Also, the fact that I'm underpainting with white makes the colors shift a little lighter. So we'll just kind of do a little test bit and we'll figure it out. Uh, weekend equals lot not long enough. Yes. Yes. Especially after all those holiday weekends, right, Ify, where we all got used to having like three days or more. <laughs> I think David had like a five day or something ridiculous like that. What the heck? What is this weird California days off thing? I don't get it. But yes. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alrighty. Let me see here. I think I want some yellow today too. I want to do a proof of concept today. Um, because I, I don't like how muddy the design is looking. And I think the way I'm going to combat that is to actually frame it with darker blue lines, like really fine ones. Um, but I want to put in some of the other, um, elements. Like I want to do my yellow line and, uh, you know, I want, I want to kind of grid out a little section here just to see if I can, we'll see if I like the effect so that if I'm only change, doing it on part, then I can easily erase it. 11 in a row. Yeah, I'm going to hold off for that until real vacation time, I think. Like when we do Hawaii um, in the fall, maybe then I'll take like some immense amount of time off. But I'll have to work my, the problem with being self-employed is you have to work your tail off then to make sure you're ahead on everything <laughs> um, to, uh, to make that work. <clears throat> All right, so I got a couple of different yellows here. I've got my lantern yellow because the thin lines are going to need a darker yellow for the yellow to show up. I've got my lemon yellow for the squares. Um, so let's see. Let's lay out our, I think, I'm trying to decide. I, I really feel like it's cat's eye. Yeah, it's cat's eye. We didn't use Naga. Naga was a little bit too dark. That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. You don't get Saturdays off. Yeah, that was that was me when I worked for Reaper if he is because I chose to do paint club. Um, so I would always be doing that. But yay. Yeah, yeah. So now we're back to the grind. Ye old grind post holidays 2021. And let's get some, I'm going to pretty much lay down all of the colors that we're, that we're using, that we are existing with. Um, we are, we can move our Highland heroine out of here. So base for the cape is void blue. I put it over a white base coat. So it's showing up actually quite lighter than it would if you would put that over a black base coat. But that also means it's easier to highlight. Cat's eye green, which is 9414. Using a lot of bones paint for this cape. Because when you're doing small freehand, you want uh, coverage usually. And so 
we're going to be using a, a combo of these, even though they're different yellows, uh, very different yellows actually. But I want the squares, essentially because I want the squares to be kind of a, um, to go well with cat's eye, I'm going to be mixing because the, where they overlap, they're going to be a lighter green or almost yellow. Um, this is a greenish yellow, the lemon yellow. So mixing it with the green makes sense. The lantern is actually for the thin yellow line that's going to go down all the stripes. Um, and so I, I need that yellow to show up, which means you want to use a stronger yellow color. If you're doing a very small thing, you need to use a stronger, more orangey yellow color for that to show up correctly. If you tried to use lemon yellow on the stripe on this plaid, it would just look white. You'd almost not see any yellow. Uh. Oh, you made a snowman? Man, I'm jealous, Twisted Oma. Well, there you go. There you go, Kariniko. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, am I going to have to switch it up just so you have more to buy? Like, because I definitely have a palette that I go to again and again and again. Um, so, that's okay. We've got to avoid blue. Let's get our cat's eye green. We need some pure white in there also because we... Uh... Oh, well, I mean, it is an Armageddon, no man, Zeke, but... <laughs> Hello, Bob and Julie. How's it going? We're plaiding today. Plaiding. And I need to plan for, like, it's only a couple days. Like, it's Wednesday that we got to work on um, Rock Troll again, guys. I got to plan for what sort of base we're doing. Although I kind of have, I kind of know what I want to do. And I'm just going to use the existing base. So I'm doing four drops of everything. And then I'll do a couple drops of water. Um, add more if I need it. Oh, nice. Yeah, large screen. I keep Reaper's Profits up, haha. Ha. Yeah, this is, uh, I don't know. I remember the Ice Apocalypse, but I don't remember when that actually happened. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember when I won as Ice Apocalypse actually happened. I think it may have been, it may have been pre-Christmas, you're right, because uh, I remember everything freezing in my Christmas lights. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, the freaky weather is here. All right, let's get some of this yellow out and some of the other yellow. So what I'm going to do, like I was just saying, everybody who didn't come in, I'm going to do a small proof of concept over here. I'm just going to use the little corner and I'm going to do like a full, the full design instead before I map out the rest of this. Um, I want it to look a little sharper than it is right now. And I want to see if it's going to do that once I put in my yellow lines or if I'm going to need to bring in a dark line to kind of trim up those green squares. So we're going to get our yellowy green and I am going to put one drop of cat's eye into that or maybe even half a drop. I just wanted to shift a little bit more toward green, a little bit more away toward yellow so I can do the centers of those squares. So I'll just put a little touch. You guys have seen me do this before when I just put the bottle up against the side of the palette and kind of wick off just a little bit to try it out. And then if I need more, I could always add more. Yes, it means I'm not doing a precise ratio, but you can treat this as like a half drop if you want. Um, and when it comes to mixing formulas, err on the side of smaller rather than larger. Uh, but as I often tell you, it is not important to get precise mixes in order to get close enough. And then we're going to do our lantern. Coffee. It was only tea time for me. No coffee. All right, there we go. Boom, 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 boom. So as I was just talking to Justin about before I uh, started the stream, I need to ask for his advice on a new uh, headset for gaming because uh, I raided with our guild. We are in a new guild, David and I, and I raided with them yesterday. And I, it, I have a terrible heavy headset that the mute button is wonky and all the rest of it. So I, I need to ask Justin for a recommendation for a lightweight, easy to use headset. Um, what do you got, Justin? Do you prefer, uh, like wireless or does that matter? I don't know if my desktop can handle wireless. Actually, I'm not certain it, it is rigged for that. It is plugged into the wall and I don't know that it has the capacity. It is not an Apple machine. So where is Oh, no, no, no. Like it, it comes with a dongle. Oh, the dongle. Like, got, yeah. 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 As long as yeah, it's I can got do a USB port that's open. Yeah. I, th I, well, I mean, once I take my existing headset out, it will. 
Okay, perfect. Then, uh, I mean, I like wireless because I, I can't stand wires, for one, really. Yeah. But the one that I've now been using for, I think, two or three months, I've had minimal issues with it, and I actually really like it. I think it's it's got, like, a uh, mechanical cutoff switch for a mute. Oh, okay, which yeah. Which means that it... Yeah, the Arctis is so in terms of like comfortability, mm-hmm. my my uh, McKaylee uses the Arctis Seven because it's got in terms of a comfortable band and mm-hmm. like ear cups, it is the most comfortable headset I've ever put on my head. Oh, and nice, far none. Okay, and it's wireless and it's fantastic. I they're kind of hard to find though. I don't I don't think they stopped making them, but they did do some sort of redesign on it or something. Mm. But um, I would just consider that. But uh, I think if if you're just looking for a wireless headset between like uh, with a re- with a reasonable price point, I would look at the Arctis Seven or the Logitech G Pro is what I call Logitech it. G Pro. Yeah, mostly I want something like the my current one is a oh gosh, it's uh, I don't remember it's it's one of the big gamer brands, but it's too heavy for me. Like it's way heavy. I want a lighter headset. I, that's that's what I would really like. And I think that's the downside of the Arctis 7. The Arctis okay. 7 to me feels heavier than oh, like okay. my, but it is, it but is probably comfy. the only headset that you could put on your head for hours at a time and never notice it. It is so comfortable. I see. I see. So comfy versus heavy is what I'm calling. So I'm going to put down comfy here and light here. I do like the mechanical mute switch because I use that a lot. Uh, that's actually what my current uh, setup has, but. But yeah, so. and I believe the mechanical the mechanical switch is on the Logitech G Pro. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's what the Arctic the Arctis uses a digital mute. I oh, okay, all right. So interesting. All right. Oh, um, you guys can't hear Justin. That's odd. Yeah, that is odd because I can hear Justin, and I didn't alter any of my settings. Let me see if it's my sound thingy. Hold on. You know, we always have to check the sound thingy. The sound thingy is sometimes weird. Oh, apparently they can hear me. Oh, okay. So it's just one person. All right. Oh, okay. Well, apparently just one person just cannot hear you. All right. Let's see here. I'm mixing up my white. All right. Well, I'll look into both of those. Maybe I'll try the lighter one because it's like, it's not like I've ever, like, the problem with rating is that for me, it goes too long. Like I, once it goes past two hours, I'm like, okay, are we done yet? Um, <laughs> it's not like in the old days where we, I was competitive rating where I could go for like, you know, four or five hours. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so. Right. And, and the Arctis 7 is, I believe, made by Steel Series, if I'm not mistaken. Um, might oh, be. okay. But, uh, there is another, Steel Series is a, is a, a set of headsets that, that, that the one I had before, the one I replaced two months ago, uh-huh. I had had it for two or three years. And it was pretty fantastic because it used interchangeable batteries, so I never had to worry about charging it. So while oh, one was being used, the other one was charging. And by the time it was dead, I just flipped them out real quick, and I was done. I never had to worry about battery life. Ah, interesting. Because that's another thing, too, is you should consider battery life for each of Right, the, if you're I will not say, plugged in. I will say this headset, yeah. I almost don't notice the the need for it because I, I even when I use the hell out of it, mm-hmm. I don't have to charge it but once every two or three days it gets kind of insane actually oh nice well that's good well yeah i mean we've gotten we've come come a long way with our battery life expectations i'm I'm certain all right absolutely that's why i'm excited about like the possibility of apple doing a uh electric car because they already like you know revolutionized battery technology once with their phones so maybe they can uh make things a little bit better for the electric cars because i would kind of like one but one expensive and two, I hate the the battery life on them right now. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping. But yes, so yeah, extended battery life is great. So what I'm doing right now, guys, is um, I'm mixing up a darker blue. I'm using two drops of void blue, and then I'm using two drops of my totally like almost out and dead blue liner, which means I need to put it on my list of things to like order from Reaper before I forget. <laughs> And the reason I'm using blue liner is that I want to darken this, but I also want to be able to do really thin lines with it, like really, really thin. Um, so blue liner on my list. Um, and be, so the liner works with that because it's much more fluid. It's made to do thin lines. Um, it'll also add just a little bit, even though it's it's pretty light coverage when you add water, it, it will add a little bit of coverage to the void. 
uh, blue. If I wanted a really heavy coverage, I would have just added pure black, but then I would have had to thin a lot to get down to that thin line uh, level. And I think I just thought this was going to be an easier way to get there. So we're going to see. Yeah, I was I was looking for lightweight Saltor. So lightweight or and or comfy. Uh, for me, lightweight equals comfy because I just hate having a heavy thing on my head. Uh, it really bothers me. So I know there are tons of great headphones out there, but specifically looking for lightweight. There we go. So dropped a couple bits of water in there. We're going to see if that's dark enough. I may need to drop another drop of liner in there, but be I'm using void blue because that's our base coat. So I wanted to start with that and mix. Hey, Val, thanks for the resub. You're not nearly as late as you were on Friday, so you can be late here, guys. Don't, I'm not like a teacher who's going to like go naughty. Why are you late? Everybody stand up and look at the person who just came in. <laughs> Although by doing that, by saying you're late, you did just make everybody look at you. <laughs> That's the equivalent of coming into the classroom and going, sorry, I'm late, you know, instead of sneaking in and sitting down in the last row like you've been there all along. Remember those college days? Long time ago. Hey, Jelly, how's it going? Yeah, iffy, <laughs> staring. <laughs> Playing to my mental image. Alrighty. So cool. Thanks for the headset recommendations. I don't know if I'm going to keep rating or not, but, you know... It's, it's too much time consuming is, is my problem with it. Like, and I didn't have that much fun because I don't know the dance steps. I have more fun once I learn the dance steps, but then it's like, you know, all this effort to, and time to get there. So I don't know if I'm willing to put that in or if I'd rather have that time to paint or do other fun things. This is a problem with computer gaming for me is it's always like just virtual enjoyment. And I look at what I could be doing with other aspects of my life. And I'm like, I could have something tangible for this time, right? Which is probably why I find it so easy to play WoW, enjoy it, but put it down. I don't get addicted to it anymore. Hey, Carrie Michael. Thank you for the resub. Seven months. Fantastic. Oh, hey, yeah, we've got an AMA this weekend, don't we? we or at the end of this week, Justin. Like, we decided it was going to go on Friday, didn't we? I'm going to put a thin, thin line. And got to be very careful, which is why I'm using those tiny little strokes, guys. What I'm trying to do is kind of trim up and outline this green because it just looks a little bit mucky to me. And so I'm trying to shrink it down and make sure, cause it's kind of taking over to my eyes. And so kind of trying to trim it down. So when I put this line, I'm not just trying to go on the outside of the green. I'm actually trying to trim down the green a little bit. So my line is actually on the inside of this green stripe instead of being on the outside of it. So slimming it down, defining it a little bit more. And I'm going to, like I said, this is kind of a proof of concept for how I might re redo or, or uh, work on the rest of this because I want to get an idea of if it's going to work and look good. So this is why I'm just spending a little time here now to uh, do this little bit just in the corner because if I don't like it, it's easy enough to paint over it if I only do a few squares. And this is something like, I think a lot of time people don't try things because they're afraid they're not going to like it. But honestly, guys, if you just like try it in a little corner, you know, not only do you just get to test it on a small space, it's easy to correct, but you also get to play around a little bit more and learn a bit more about paint. I mean, that's how you get better is trying stuff. And if you don't want to have to repaint everything, just try it on a little corner. See if you like it. If you don't like it, then if I didn't like it right now, I would just go back over these dark lines with white and put my uh, my cat's eye green right over the top and we'd be back where we started. Boom. Easy. Yeah, we started it last year or last year. Huh? Yeah, we did start it last year. <laughs> That's the funny thing. We did start it last year. Um, we started it last time we were on this model. Coos. We uh, talked about a lot. So you may want to catch the other stream if you really want the setup. Like I just only just started putting paint on it. And right now I'm just adding some extra lines here, some extra dark blue lines around the outside of these green stripes because I, I'm not happy with how crisp the pattern is. Now, note one thing, guys, if I really wanted a big crisp pattern, I could have made this plaid pattern much bigger. 
Like I could have done much wider stripes and done a much larger checkerboard, but I chose to reach for something that looked more natural and more to scale, which means I'm doing a lot of little stuff. And that is part of the problem here. So you could always choose to make this bigger and make it easier to do. And then I would have a lot less trouble with the crispness of it because I would have so much space. Every square would be so much larger. Every line would be thicker. I wouldn't have as many lines, but the plaid would still carry. Like the idea of the plaid, the concept, visual concept would still carry. So that is one thing. The other thing is like, there are so many different ways I could uh, tackle this guys, like as far as how I'm doing it. Like I could have thrown in some shading and highlighting on the blue or, you know, before I did this. But in reality, the reason I didn't was because uh, I'm going to be covering over so much of the blue with the green anyway. And if I highlight the blue right now, it's going to bring it closer to the green. So it's I'm going to lose, once again, I'm going to lose drama. So it's easier for me to do what we did with Juliana, the herbalist, if you remember when we did her stripy dress where I just blocked it all in and then I applied highlights and I was able to more pick and choose and use some clever shading to try to see now how this is crisping this up. I'm going to actually do one more line here. See, the reason I'm keeping going, by the way, is because I like it. If I hadn't liked it, I would have stopped and maybe just tried to flesh it out a little more. But I also like how this putting these dark lines is giving me these little squares, which is very much like real tartan, right? As, as the threads cross over, you get an interruption. It's an all just all stripes. It's, it's, you know, it's got squares and outlines and you know, where the, where all the weave is crossing over and all the colors of thread cross over, you get some variance. So, and this has the advantage of giving us a little bit more, um, crispness. And if I, if I thin a green stripe too much, again, I can just take my white and paint over this dark blue and I'm going to be just peachy. All right. So right now that's where we're at. See, see how much sharper now this is compared to this. See how I didn't like when I, when I said it was muddy before, do you see what I meant now? So, um, it is void. It's void coops. Yeah, for some reason, Twisted Oma, I have no reason. I, like, you know how you normally forget to change the date, like when you're writing the date? I write the date every day because I do a journal um, every day. I, I write in my journal. Um, and usually I do have a couple days where I have to, like, reinforce. But this year, I think 2020 was just so weird that that I had no problem remembering this 2021. <laughs> it's kind of funny. All right, so I've got this lemon yellow that I put just a little bit of cat's eye green in. Now I'm going to come in and I'm going to, I'm gonna again, this is proof of concept. Remember how we were going to make these guys lighter. Now, lemon is pretty light and it's got a lot of white in it. So I'm not going to undercoat it. I'm just going to see if I can get it to read as lighter, significantly lighter, by painting it on by itself. If it doesn't work, I might have to put a couple coats because I did thin it. I probably shouldn't have thinned it so much, but I wanted to be able to make a nice square. And so I sacrifice coverage for precise precision. And that is a thing you do. When you thin your paint, you can be a lot more precise with it, but you do sacrifice coverage. Likewise, if you go for coverage, you may find it harder to do very precise designs because you've sacrificed that precision because what you need is thin paint to come off your brush very precisely. So the best thing is to kind of figure out like the sweet spot in between those things that give you enough precision but also enough coverage so that with just a couple coats, maybe you can get it. I could try, there's my lighter, lighter checks. There they are, yay. Now the great thing about this guys is that if I wanna even highlight these little checkers, I can because I can go straight up to pure lemon, maybe with a little bit of white in it, um, if I really wanna highlight these little guys uh, later, so. Yeah, tartans are not hard. You're just building a checkerboard. And then all you have to do, like I was noting earlier, is you have to figure out, um, you know, how how to make everything stand out and be crisp, which is what I did here with introducing these dark lines. So now we got, now you fill in all your little squares. It's actually pretty fun because you're just like drawing a grid and then you're filling in your squares with different colors. Now I still do need my yellow line, which usually runs over everything. And we're going to see how that works. That's my next step in the proof of concept. 
But in reality, I probably should do my grid all up this fold, like this side to up on this fold, just like I've done all this. So I should essentially finish out this area of the cloak, which is cool because then you guys can kind of see my stages, right? So we can do that. And I've got all my colors open for it, so that's easy. I'm just going to put in my other little yellow squares. Like again, they might need a couple of coats because I did thin them down a lot. But in general, you're getting the idea. So now, let's just quick um, block in the rest of the bars across up here so that I can do the yellow stripe without and get everything going on because I don't want to I don't want to be all done down here with my yellow stripes and then have to you know it's kind of awkward the yellow stripe should really be the last thing you do so in this case so and it's going to be a doozy because it is going to wipe out a lot and what I'm talking about with the yellow stripe guys is the thin yellow stripe that goes down the middle of each of the green bars and these are already so thin especially because I've I've trimmed them down so the question is, can I do this without completely losing all my green? I'm going to have to be really fine and really, really tight with it. But this is why I say, if you guys are starting to do tartan, make it a bigger checkerboard. Be, be larger. I make all of your stripes double what I have here. That's going to make it a lot easier for you guys. When I started doing tartan, that's what I did. Because otherwise, the finer and finer you try to make the pattern, the closer you may come to just wiping it out entirely. So this could be too fine for me to actually do the yellow line. Like this is a thing where you have to think about scale, where in a tartan, if she was really this big, I'd be looking at her across the parking lot over there to get a human to be this big. And would I be able, <clears throat> even able to see a fine yellow stripe down the middle of these? Probably not. So that's what you're running into is it is realistic. Um, it may frustrate you if you want to do something super elaborate, but you got a question if you notice that, you know, when you try to put that final step in that you're totally killing your pattern, then you have to like maybe compromise and say no. And if I wanted to do this, I needed to make the pattern bigger in the first place. Uh, Penny, do you ever use a very fine felt tip pen to dark line? Never. Um, actually, I feel that... Uh, Bow tree, because I have so much experience with painting, because my, my brush control is like pretty astonishing at this point, um, I also draw a lot, so I'm good with a pen also. The problem is that the finest felt tip pen that I can get really won't let me do like what I can do with a really fine joint brush. Um, it also doesn't let me get any variance. Like I can do a really fine line in pretty much any color, including white, um, you know, and I can, and it's, and it's finer than almost any felt tip pen I could use. Uh, I also, because I just have a lot of experience here, I can, I actually am much better with the brush. Um, so it's not cheating to use a pen on a model, but what you do need to be cognizant of is that a lot of felt tip pens, if you're going to seal afterwards, if you're going to put a sealer over your model, a lot of them will bleed. So make sure to use something that's archival and non-bleed, um, if you're going to do that. So, but yeah, it's perfectly valid technique for freehand. Um, like, don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, the first time I did a tartan, I did it on one of the lupines, who's a big wolf guy. You know, it was probably uh, double the size of her. And I did a bigger tartan than this on his loincloth. So he was a bigger model and I did a bigger tartan. And it was, that was my first, some of my first tries at tartan. Um... So yeah, doing it on a bigger mini or just making a bigger pattern. I mean, uh, yeah, no, it's no problem, Bo. But I'm just like, if, if I had my sacrifice model in here and I showed you that crazy freehand, you'd like be like, I, you, you can't do it with a pen. <laughs> There's still stuff because the brush just has, I mean, if you look at the tip on this sucker, look at how needle that is. And that's how fine I can get the line. And I mean, I do a lot. I've done a lot of pen and pencil and everything. You know, I do a lot of other medias because my background is as a 2D artist, but I have yet to find anything that can get this sharp in a, in a pen and still have the line be consistent, unless it's a fountain pen, which at which point you're doing ink where you're almost like it's just, you're just using a metal nib uh, instead of the fine hairs. But if you're, if you don't have a super fine brush like this, if you don't have a Kalinsky, then yeah, I'd say a felt tip's just as good as any tack line you could use probably. At that point, you're painting with plastic either way. So I guess the overall answer to your question, Bo, would be it depends. It depends on your brush control and the quality of the brush that you're using. Um, 
doing freehand with a pen is also going to give you, because as you, as you notice, I hold my brush like a pencil, right guys? So I use the same kind of brush stroke um, as I would like a pen stroke. Um, but the more, uh, the, the difference is, right, that as a pen, it doesn't matter how much pressure necessarily you're putting on the model. Whereas uh, with brush, it's very important how much pressure you're putting on with your brush tip. So there's, there's different amounts of things to learn I went and totally went for the wrong color there, guys. I forgot we have to finish gridding out this section. So remember, we're putting down white first. We're going to kind of mark where the bottom part of our green stripe goes. Just kind of block these guys out. Now that I've realized I need to put a yellow stripe down the middle, I may kind of subtly slide my stripes a little bit wider. Um, but I'm going to kind of mark where they go, where they start. And yeah, I mean, it's a painting demonstration, Bo, but it's also this show, you you came to the right show to ask your question because this show is all about like education, like I, I teach. So um, I love questions like yours because it lets us talk about some other topics uh, than usually. It gets a little boring if I don't have people asking <laughs> interesting things because <laughs> I mean, I like to talk through the whole show. So see how I'm like, I marked out. Kind of the top and bottom you can see i'm using a couple of different brush strokes one two one two one two three one two one two you know i'm kind of doing two little dashes oh no i blurfed what do we do throw water on it rub with brush problem is that the paint was really thin there so it dried pretty much instantaneously let this be a lesson to you guys the thinner your paint the faster it's gonna dry i'm gonna try get a taclon to scrub that up and if not then i just have to paint it over taclon oh taclon works so, okay, stiffer bristle brush did allow me to scrub up that thin white blorf. There it is. Yay, Taclon. I was useful, says Taclon. Yeah, it's definitely, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that, it is certainly challenging, Bo. Now, the other way to look at that, though, is that it is excellent practice. So when you're trying to do that, there are certain things you should keep in mind that'll help you build your brush control when you're trying to do it with the brush. Um, one thing I, that pe some people recommend is to try it on a piece of paper first with the brush to kind of warm up and practice with it. Um, another thing that I usually recommend is lining like scaly armor like like or dragon scales. Um, and always keep your hand relaxed. Always make sure that you've got very little paint on your brush and that your paint is thinner. Um, and try to keep your hand around the same angle when you're doing the brush stroke. Try to be repeating a single brush stroke. Try not to move all over the place. Um, I had an article on this on my Patreon for those of you who are members or those of you who are thinking about joining. It's patreon.com slash painting big. Uh, one of my articles from 2019, earlier in 2019, I think it's around March or February, uh, is how to build brush control faster. So I give a bunch of tips like that in there and a little bit, I elaborate a bit on it. All right, let's go. Um, so what we're doing is we got to kind of keep an eye as you're doing this line across, you got to keep an eye and make sure you're keeping the right distance from this top line. So just go slow. Don't use, it is, this is not a horse race. And you can use little tiny strokes to kind of tentatively dab the line in. I certainly do so that I can correct with the next stroke. This is not a fast technique, um, but I mean, you're looking for a precise, cool, impressive freehand. So it's not gonna be fast. Oh, hold on, I lost it. Oh, sorry, Taclon is the plastic bristle brush brushes, Francis. Um, yeah, so it's type of nylon material. So when you see like like the Reaper red handle brush it brushes, and if you ever see an orange bristle or a white bristle, that's Taclon. It's a much stiffer bristle, which influences how the paint comes off of it, how easily the paint comes off of it. Uh, it also, as you can see here, see the kind of lighter area at the edge at the tip there. It's it's starting to fuzz. So the bristles wear a lot faster, a lot, lot faster than natural hair does. Um, and it does not keep as good of a tip. Yeah, that's another good tip. I think I covered that one too, Bo. It's that old, uh, I learned it when I was playing pool and learning to play darts. And people use it when they're doing shooting and people do it, all sorts of stuff. But yes, painting on the exhale relaxes your body and your muscles. It's a natural relaxant. And so... 
it essentially, if you are tensing up, it's easier to relax and paint a steady line. That's why it's working that way. Uh, um, oh, the really cheap ones don't even bother. There are, there are um, synthetic brushes that are trying to mimic natural Kalinske hair now. Uh, they're trying to taper the hair. And some of them are quite good. The Master's Touch from Hobby Lobby um, are the closest I've seen. But you're still going to run into that curling tip. So they they haven't yet created like and is and and the paint doesn't quite come off as well. There's just something about natural hair that uh, that paint just rolls off really easily when you're at the right consistency. And I have yet to encounter a synthetic brush that does quite the same. Now here I may have gotten too close. See, I've got a much longer line down here, and. I've, I was going shorter and more square up here, and I forgot that I had a little bit more space down here. This is actually more pro probably more accurate. It's not a bad thing if I decide to keep this, even though it's a little bit inaccurate, just because uh, down here we can see that the hem is unraveling. So it's entirely possible that these threads have gotten pulled out, and then there, there's going to be a little bit of disparity. Um, but I also have to question, you know, how many stripes am I going to want to do here? Do I want to follow this up? Yeah, I think I do want to follow it up. I'm going to just try it. If I'm a little bit off, I'm a little bit off. Yeah, some people react that way to caffeine and shake more, and some people don't. So it really depends, Time Stitcher. Yeah, pretty much um, you do get what you pay for with brushes. Uh, it tends to be true across art supplies in general, sad as that is. Though you can certainly do, I know there's certainly a point with where you hit diminishing returns, and it depends on the qualities that you want in your paint or your, um, in my case, like colored pencils. So, you know, I paid a lot for a set of Turin Dash colored pencils, but that's because I wanted something with more pigment and less wax and a, and a softer feel and a more blendable ability. Whereas if you're just doing colored pencil, like where you just are doing maybe more technical stuff and you don't need all that, you could go with um, Prismacolor and be perfectly happy, just like I was for years. So, so yeah, it's like you could paint with Taclons. I mean, Jennifer Haley, who's a multiple international award-winning painter and one of possibly one of the most famous painters out there. Um, you know, she, Jen worked with synthetics for years when she was starting out. And eventually she switched to Glinsky's because she got to the point where she needed that extra performance. But you don't have to pay that much money for a brush to get good. It's, it's what it is simply is that when you, when you do understand paint consistency and when you have a bit of brush control you, and you buy one of these brushes, it's going to essentially level you up instantly because it's going to let you do stuff that the other brush just wouldn't. Let's see here. I need to be a little bit closer here. And being a little bit off, like my, my lines are a bit wobbly here. It's not a big deal. For one thing, I can use this dark paint that I started out with to trim them up. So I'm not going to sweat it, guys. I'm not even going to sweat it if they look wobbly at the end. You know what? At that point, we're going to have this intricate plaid pattern. Nobody's going to care. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Saltor. I mean, that's the case, right? Because it's just, it, they keep a better tip. They're built better. They've got a higher quality hair. It is it is what it is. But if you're not, like, doing... Um, actually, pardon me. I just wanted to... My, my blue is being annoying, my dark blue. So I wanted to add another drop of water to it. Boink. I think I thinned it too much. Um, but... Uh, but you don't have to, right? It's not it's not a must. It's It's dependent. But if you are getting like qu pretty good and you're noticing that you're frustrated with the way your brush is performing do try upgrading yes yeah, gaining levels is good everybody likes gaining levels Doo -doo -doo. tips curled faster than golden yeah and and that is because the tips thin right see that's a problem jabberwock is they they managed to carry the paint well, but then they didn't uh, appreciably expand the lifespan because the hairs got thinner. So they're more uh, likely to curl with use. So yeah, 
Now they are cheaper and you'll go through more, but it always comes back to me to the fact that I can brutalize one of these Kalinskis for like a year and it'll still have a perfect tip. It'll just have thinned so much that I can't use it anymore. Um, and uh, whereas, you know, I could go through two dozen Taclons in that time. I'm still getting a better bang for my buck, even if I paid 25 bucks for this, which I didn't. You know, usually it's 18 to 20. So it comes down to if you take good care of your brushes and you don't leave them paint down, nose down in your paint water, think about buying a good brush and giving it a run. And if you want advice on which brushes are awesome, you can ask for, you know, ask on our Reaper social media or Discord or wherever. If you're on my Patreon, certainly ask. I also did a little uh, write-up on brushes a while ago. All right, so now I'm using my, um, my dark blue to thin these lines before I even put the green down. Um, because I just wanted to see if I could adjust them a little bit right out the gate. And the answer is, yeah, sure. And by the time I get all this uh, gridded out, it's probably going to be just fine. So like, don't like kick your perfectionist to the curb guys a little bit. Like, yeah, if you're, if you're going for crystal brush or golden demon or some really high end like painting competition, then you can be finagling, right? Okay. Yeah. Then you have to like, you know, try to make it like, like honestly good. But if you're painting and practicing and, and enjoying the hobby, don't be hard on yourself. Perfectionism is the energy and the enemy of enjoyment in that case. For me, when I'm painting for competition, I enjoy getting that finagly about it. So that ju just feeds into my, uh, my enjoyment at that point. So I do actually enjoy trying my best. But when you're stressing out about trying to learn something, that's not the time for that. Not the time for it. All right, I'm gonna correct this a little bit by putting some of my cat's eye in here. There we go. So once again, I'm just, I've got all my colors open. I can reach for anything I want. I can correct, I can push. The dark blue is the base coat. After I do the dark blue, Duke, I do white lines in a white grid. So I've just, what I'm doing is painting this in stages to, so that you guys can see all the steps. So I started out here, I went across the bottom and put down white first because my green is pretty transparent. Most yellowy greens are. And so to get a nice, strong, um, really uh, sharp line, I needed to put down white first, which is why I'm doing white over here as well. This is gonna be green, it's not gonna stay white. Um, so I do the white stripes, I go over them with the green, that's what you see here. Then I do my cross grid in white and go over it with the green, that's what you see down here. Um, but then I decided today I wanted to kind of, I wasn't really happy with how this looked. So I decided to do kind of a proof of concept over here on this side and carry out my pattern like to finished mode to see if I still liked it. That way it's easy to paint over or correct before I go and I do this huge area over here. And so with freehand, I will often do that. I will work on a small panel. I will see if I like it. I will adjust it or I will decide to trash it entirely and do something else. So the dark blue is behind everything. The dark blue, the entire cape was originally painted dark blue. Then I work over in white. Then I cover the white and green. Then we come back and we do all this stuff, um, which is I've been doing a dark blue to kind of trim up the edges of uh, where the pattern is. And when it's white, can you, can you see, you can really see where it's kind of screwed up, <laughs> where something is too wide or something is more narrow. You can absolutely see that. So it is going to kind of emphasize and scream your flaws at you. Um, but you should kind of ignore it if you're not really, if you're just practicing and you're not trying to be perfect. And like I said, being perfect is sometimes the enemy of having fun. So it all depends on your goals for your painting session. I'm going to get this one. I'm going to get this one. Often I will not carry all the stripe into the recesses up here. If there's a really deep fold, um, then I'm probably not going to go there. I am going to put just the suggestion of a stripe up here. We'll, we'll trim this up. So now I want to trim this up. I need to move this stripe up a bit. I need this stripe to come down a bit. I need to make this stripe a little bit higher. I need to bring this stripe a little bit higher. So now is my adjustment period. I've got my white kind of blocked in. I kind of can see what's too narrow and too thick. 
And now I'm going to kind of assess. Now, part of the problem here is that this is a stretched out edge. And so the problem is this is not stretched out. So what I could, what the problem could get into here, guys, is that we might end up being kind of crooked because of the way this, this stretched out fabric is working, right? Because it's a curve, it's a crescent, it's not straight. If her cape had like been only this, it would be so much easier. So be wary of starting a plaid pattern on something like this that is stretched out because it may kind of run you into problems with stuff running together or stretching out too much. Um, so what I'm gonna do, or what am I gonna do? Am I just gonna carry it over? I'm going to have to angle it a bit. I think it's all going to fit still. I have this idea that it's all going to fit, but I definitely have skinny lines here and thicker lines here. So what I probably need to do is I probably need to, I might need to wipe it out. Hmm. Hmm. If I do want to keep it this way, I'm going to have to gradually go there. So I think I am going to, it may be heartbreaking, but I may wipe this out. We'll see. We'll see. I may just wipe out these guys and see if I can space them better. We'll see. Hmm, I'm considering. I'm cons I, at this point, I have to stop and say, can I fix it? I think I'm going to say no. So, all right. When, when you screw up, when you decide that you have gone too far. Now, the other thing I could do is make tighter lines up here. Um, so I can consider that before I slobber blue all over this. And actually, that'll, that'll be what I do. So... Wipe out your white. Don't worry. It's easy to fix. So when you need to destroy a section, and now what I'm going to do before I even tackle this again is I'm going to straighten out these guys. I'm going to figure out where I went wrong, um, why I got so wide, and how I need to fix it. So one thing, the problem that I'm really seeing, though, is that this little guy on the bottom is way too thin, and I don't know if I can fix it. Like, I may need to actually destroy this entire section. And actually, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to I'm not gonna try to preserve a thing. Here we go. And everybody goes, no. But that's why you're doing this. That's why you kind of have to do it in little sections. Where I got in trouble is where I decided to run up and do the whole thing instead of slowly progressing. And then I got out of, uh, pr out of order, out of uh, proportion. There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. So what I'll do is I'll even go, well, I think I'm okay there. Kind of block in this little bit. I might have to put on two coats of this blue, but part of the reason we started with void blue is that it is a fairly high coverage blue, even though it's really vibrant. So I thinned it, so it's not, you know, it's not showing up real good right here, but we'll do two coats. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I make them, but I don't sweat them. Like, I don't dwell on them. You just do it. You just go. What's the big deal? Who cares? <laughs> I make mistakes in writing all the time, and I have to go back and edit everything. Sometimes I even have to chop entire pages of text that I decide don't fit with the story. This is that. This is editing. It doesn't mean you're a bad painter. It doesn't mean that you're mortal, quote unquote, everybody's mortal. I mean, it's like. I, the problem I have with the mortal comment is that it, it disparage. I feel it disparages mortality where I think that I, I don't, I don't like that attitude. <laughs> kind of, I'm like, I'm like, well, yeah, I'm mortal. Everybody is that, you know, yes, everybody makes mistakes. Um, it's only translucent right now, Bo, because I thinned it. Although it is a more, uh, a lot of master series. If you haven't tried MSP, which is the paint line that I created for Reaper, by the way. So I actually made this. I created all of these colors and these paints from the ground up and mixed them for years at Reaper. I mixed every batch. Um, so Void, a lot of our paints uh, have coverage according to the pigment quality. So more like an artist paint, less light, everything has to cover and be goopy. More like um, if it's a naturally, if it's the nature of the pigment to be slightly transparent, it's going to be a slightly transparent paint. So because Void is a really vibrant blue, um, you can kind of see it there. It's a vibrant dark blue, so it's going to have a little bit less coverage. But I also remember I thinned it two to one. So four drops of this plus two drops of water means it's not going to cover that great. So now I'll go back and I'll hit it again. Yeah, 
so and when I hit it with this second uh, second coat then it should pretty much cover up everything I've done which was one reason to use void it it does have a because it's a bones line paint so MSP bones instead of just the MSP core which are MSP core colors um, they do they do tend to have a little bit better coverage than others because uh, that's just how we built them. We built Bones to be a slightly higher coverage line, just like we did the old HD line. A lot of those HD colors got canceled and a lot got ported over into Bones, um, depending on sales. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot better. Now I can go over. Um... Yeah, exactly, Francis. Francis, yeah. Yeah, I don't throw whole documents. I seldom, th I what I do find is that uh, I seldom make that big of a mistake. Um, like if I, if I had to throw out a whole chapter or a whole document, uh, Francis husband, <laughs> whatever your name is. Hi. Um, I mean, that would mean that my foundation, my foundational idea was flawed and that's really unlikely. Cause I, I block out and outline everything before I go into it. And I usually have a pretty clear idea now, actually when writing nonfiction. So if you are writing nonfiction, I have tossed an entire section and just rewritten parts of it into something else. So I can see, I feel you there. I feel you there. I don't write a lot of nonfiction, but I do for my dog club when I'm doing stuff about genetics or uh, breeder education. So, so I can totally say, yeah, I have, I have actually tossed an entire chapter um, before and just put little bits of it into another chapter. All right. So now we need to redo our vertical lines. Yeah. Yeah. Trillero. You've, that's exactly it. Nobody's life is on the line. It's like, including yours, right? Like, okay, your time is on the line and your time is super valuable. Time is the one thing we can never get back that we spend in today's world. So, you know, you're within your rights, honestly. And I have done this actually, I guess, you know what? If, if the equivalent thing to throwing out an entire chapter um, or an entire document is to chuck the mini in the trash and just paint a different mini, I have done that. So yes, actually. Haven't done it with my writing, but I have done it with a miniature before. If I got really frustrated with this and really disliked it, I would chuck it and just start a new one. I'm not a painting machine, Val. Yeah. Not ever, in, in no stretch of the word. Like, you might, the only reason I look like I know what I'm doing is because I've been doing it for, oh gosh, am I going to reveal my age? Like, almost 40 years, guys. That's a long time to be handling a brush. Although the vast majority of that progress was made... Um, so I'm just doing little lines to kind of remember where my vertical stripes are. Yeah. Chucking it. I'm more likely, actually, I hate timeout boxes now. I hate shelf of shame's time stitcher. If I look at a model on the shelf of shame and I am like, you know what? I'm just never going to finish this. I let it go. I do the Elsa from <laughs> Frozen. I just let it go. Toss it, chuck it, give it to somebody else to play with. Yeah. Painting for the drug cartel ain't all it cracks up to me. Impressive that I throw out models, Nitra, or or is the plaid impressive? <laughs> we were just talking about the fact that I just screwed it up and I have to repaint it. So, so now we're doing we're and this time we're gonna learn our lesson, guys. We're gonna go slow. We're gonna really go slow and go as we go. So we have a chance since we have totally covered over our past blorfs. We now have a chance to just grid it out section by section and try to make it all work. So we're going to extend our little lines bit by bit and always assess them for how close together they are. See how thin I can draw these though, guys. Like you couldn't do that with a pen. I'm sorry. You just can't get that fine. I hate simple green and I dislike stripping Shadow Raven. Like I won't do it. it to me, it's a waste of time. I forget the mini in there. Then I try to get it out. It doesn't clean up as well as I want it to. Dead. It's dead to me. <laughs> oh, let's see here where am i oh yeah i was trying to extend these lines so let's uh we've got them more or less equidistant if i look at them this one's a little close to this but i can uh 
since this is on a fold and it's a little bit more spacing anyway, I can grab my dark blue paint and uh, thin this white line down a little bit. So this is where I'm going to be using a lot of this dark blue that I mixed up. Because it's a little higher coverage and I can be a little more precise with it, I'm going to use it right now to spread out this little line. And you know what it's great about is that uh, what's great about it is that since this is going down into a fold, if I get these lines a little closer together, it's not going to matter. It already looks closer together because it's on a fold. So you have a little bit, because cloth is folding and going back and forth, you have room to be a little imprecise and it's not going to be too, too bad. The problem here was that this is a very flat area. So all of the imperfections were going to show. But yeah, Val, I make a lot of mistakes in the course of my painting. I'm just confident about it. So it doesn't like seem like, you know, like I recognize when I make a mistake, I stop, I assess, and then I fix it. And I'm not afraid to throw out work. Never be afraid to throw out work. If you have to prime over it, do it. If you like to strip minis and you don't think it's a waste of time like I do, do it. Do it. Whatever makes you not hate the mini. Oh yeah, the Red Dragon of Crin. Somebody actually asked me about painting one of those the other day. Oh, I can, man, those old guys, I can chuck those so easy, Trillero. <laughs> it's terrible. Like the real test for me now, and keep in mind, guys, that I had to move like twice in the last three years because after my divorce, I moved. And then I moved again when I moved out here to the West Coast to be with David and when I moved from, away from Texas. So my practice when I move is to throw out like the thir a third of my life that I haven't looked at for a decade. So if I haven't looked at it and I'm never going to use it, then it's done. I give it. I gave so many models to friends before I moved. Like I, I would bring lots of them to paint club at Reaper and just give them away. Pull people back into my, you know, paint department where nobody was working and just say, okay, guys, take them, take them or they're trash. Because then somebody who actually was excited about the model could have it. It wasn't sitting in a box in my closet, sitting there. So, I mean, yeah, there are some minis definitely who are um, that are collectible for sure. But for me, it, it really comes down to if I'm never going to paint it, because I'm not a collector by nature, like as far as that goes, I'm really not. Um, I find as I progress through life that I just prefer to have less and less stuff and the stuff I have has to be stuff that I really value. Yeah, I mean, I suppose stuff that that's never made again, like that's where you could hesitate. But even there, I've just, it feels better to me not to be lugging it around. I mean, maybe I've just gotten really uh, anti-stuff recently. Although that can't be, uh, that really can't be a thing because I've still got a closet full of miniatures over there <laughs> that I did haul to California. But I made them fight for my love. Like, and now I'm thinking about making them fight for my love again. Because uh, I feel like I've got too much and I've got like three Kickstarters. David and I have like three or four Kickstarters coming. It's like, oh my God. Like, I don't have room for another box. So I tend to, I, that's where it's kind of sad that we don't have a local painting club right now is because, uh, because of the COVID, because normally I would just bring whatever I didn't want to my local paint club and all my local paint clubbers would be like, oh my God, this is such an awesome model. And I'm just, yeah, I just don't think I'm going to paint it here. Have it. Yay. You know, I like to, I like to give away my minis to people who are actually going to, cause none of them are bad. Like I have, I have some really cool stuff. I just don't think I'm going to get to painting it. Like, I suppose I could make a concerted effort to speed paint stuff, but I don't enjoy speed painting. Like it always comes down to like, what do you enjoy in the hobby? Right? When would you strip down a, oh, the one time you would ever, I see. Oh, client that overprimes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad I don't ever have to deal with that again. These days, if I take a commission, I'm going to be the one who wants to put together the mini. All right, so we're kind of regridding here, guys. And we have to make sure again to keep things you can see I can see right away when I'm getting wobbly because we're doing this like just in a really you know we're just doing it slowly and kind of be like okay I need to widen that out 
I need to bring these together. Again, this is splaying out. So if I get a little bit of spread at the bottom, I'm not too concerned. They are going to get closer at the top just because this is tighter. So that's a, that's a, um, a spacing thing that isn't really an issue because a viewer will look at the cape, realize that it is splaying out and realizing that the colors will be wider at the bottom and closer at the top. Yeah, yeah, I've done eBay purges too. I, I funded a motorhome vacation to upstate New York that way one year. I sold all our old GW stuff and raised like a couple grand. There was definitely some vintage stuff that was never going to be reprinted in that stuff. I still have a couple of old games workshop models that, again, will never be brought back. And uh, that I kind of hang on to both for nostalgia and because, well, maybe I can part with them for money in the future. Um, but yeah. Yeah, Bones 5 gets out of hand when you start uh, having pirate ships. <laughs> like, looking at how big the box has to be for that sucker. It's like the Maldricar box. I have a Maldricar in my closet. I'm probably going to give it away to somebody. Maybe I'll give it away to somebody on my personal stream. Maybe we'll do a special giveaway because I'm like, I have the resin and if I paint any version of Maldricar, it's almost certainly going to be that resin. So the extra Maldricar, yes, there's such a thing as an extra Maldricar, um, I could do as a giveaway. All right. So I'm trying to bring these guys a little tighter now. I'm taking my dark blue. Um, this outer line, I do want to keep a little bit of blue going up the edge. So I do want to kind of make sure that that line is there. Built a new cupboard. Oh, UPS guy is going to hate you. Yeah, for sure. Good morning, Inara. Hey, I blorfed Inara and now I have to repaint everything. People were amazed. I need to make more like... I need to figure out a way to make more mistakes on stream so you guys can like be like, you know, understand that I make mistakes all the time. A lot of the time, though, mistakes that I make are almost always going to be on bigger models, I would say. There's a lot more room to screw up there. A lot of these, um, a lot of the 28s, it's like, unless I'm doing something intricate like this, I know what I'm doing, and so it's very unlikely that I'm going to like make a big blorf because I don't usually like I don't usually like push myself big time when I'm on stream right I'm not doing experimental stuff for you guys I'm trying to do stuff that's accessible so that you can get something out of it I'm not trying to do like the you know the barrel rolls in the air I'm not handing you the controls of the plane and saying okay let's do some barrel rolls and let's go into a flat spin you know I'm not trying to do that for you guys I'm trying to um, give you uh, accessible techniques uh, and not as, and because I'm doing that, if these are things that I've done so often, that's why you guys don't see me make a lot of mistakes. But spacing mistakes with a freehand pattern, that's something that's common to make mistakes at just because, or, or because of the way the cloth moves, it's not even a mistake. It's just a, you have a misconception of how it's going to look. And once you fill it in more, it looks wrong, right? Oh, yeah. Ralph Arthur, Children of the Night. Still in clear... Yeah. If it's still in plastic, then you don't take it off. Like, when Gen Con comes back, they usually have an auction at Gen Con. That's a good place to uh, liquidate those kind of old vintage D&D &D things because there's usually a decent buyership for it there. So I don't know how good eBay is for that sort of thing now. But the, the advantage of Gen Con is that you know you have a bunch of people who are actually looking for that sort of stuff. So old uh, vintage miniatures and modules and things like that may get a better price there. Unless a bunch of people are selling the same thing. I worked the Gen Con auction one year a long time ago. Long, long time ago. My first year of college. It was, it was actually fun. There we go. There, now look at that. Now that's very much more even, isn't it? 
It's because I was starting slow. I was slowly widening my stripes. I was keeping an eye on spacing. I still need to fix that outer stripe. He's still a little bit dodgy and the, the edge of this one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You totally let him do. Oh, yes. Also, people get the convention fever. Exactly. Exactly, Trillero. You got it. Yeah, a lot of it is, but, you know, some collectors really want the original box set with the original shrink. Alrighty. Now I'm going to try to bring this in. Straighten up this one. You know what? I'm thinking about going to the other room and grabbing my sacrifice bus so I can show you guys. Like, there's a pattern on that that I actually redid, I think, twice or three times. Like, wiped it out and redid it. I know I know, I had a huge redo on it at one point because I had to reverse it. Like, I realized I had done the design the wrong... Like, it was, it was this way instead of, like, that way. Like, it was... I had to actually flip the design. Um, and it's the one that I did, uh, on, I did it on video. It was my crystal brush entry, actually. But it, it brings home the point of, even if you have put a crap ton of effort into a design, if you look at it and it's wonky and you really are, you're really invested in it and you really want it to be great, uh, and right that, you know, take the time and do it. Just don't, don't, you know, fret about it. And don't judge yourself over it is the biggest thing. Don't think that, you know, oh, well, you know, Ben Comets would never have screwed up this way. Aaron Lovejoy would never have screwed up this way. Don't do that. Yeah, so now we're like, we can look at it and the, and the, the ways when it looks wobbly, those are actually on a fold. So, you know, when I, they're perfect, you know, or close enough, close enough. It only needs to be close enough. Um, but you know what? Let me give me give me just a second. Let me go and get sacrifice. And I'll, and I'll show you guys the section that I had to repaint. Just kind of bring home that, you know, I, I do this in my personal life. One second, one second. Give me one. I know right where it is. I, we put it in the um, case. So sacrifice is a little naked, so I'm going to put my thumb over the naughty bits. But here, let's get her in here. So this is a bust. Black Sun sells it. Most of you have seen it. This section on the shoulder, which let's see if we can get really in focus. Yeah, good. And let's see if we can get closer. There we go. So all these tiny little brush strokes here, you can see how big my uh, my brush is next to here. Let me put my thumb in here so you can see how tiny this is. There's my bad thumb that I like totally sliced, a, a broke a piece off of. Um, I had to reverse this. You see how it's kind of going like this way? When I started out, it was going the wrong way and it was making this design down here screw up. So essentially I had to block out everything below these little this little like winglet and the top I had to destroy it all and go back and repaint all of it so if it's not right and you're invested in it repaint it and don't don't like don't think you're a bad painter like don't get down on yourself and say oh my god I just you know threw away all this time and I ruined it and da 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 you know don't do that to yourself just just do it. Just It's just a, the nature of the beast. When you're doing something intricate and cool, um, you know, then you're going to event, you know, sometimes you're just going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. So just go ahead, come back in, redo it and, you know, and don't, don't get too crazy. So yeah, this was my crystal brush entry. It actually did make the cut. It didn't win one of the top threes, which is not, uh, not surprising given that it is, uh, you know, it's just a stock model. A lot of guys, the guys and guys and gals who win tend to be like converting and sculpting a lot. But, uh, but I was very happy with the fact that she did make the, uh, the voting cut. So, and then that's the back. So I did not just be crazy enough to do all that freehand on the front. I was also crazy enough to do all that freehand on the back, including the texture on the cloth down here, the linen texture. So yeah, 
Yeah, the uh, the dagger is uh, is Damascus, and it's done in metallics, which is funky because when I first started at Bow, um, I could have sworn that NMM was the way to do this, but then when I got down to it, it was it I couldn't get the Damascus effect without going metallics. Like I just it wasn't working. So let's get our mini back, back in focus. There we go. But yeah, so that was sacrifice, and yes, I did have to repaint an entire section. It was one of the first sections I did. After that, I learned. <laughs> so just think of it as an educational opportunity, everybody. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's hard to keep a sense of humor, right? It's really hard to keep a sense of humor when you screw up. And you maybe do feel like, really, you know, like, my painting idol would not do this, would not have screwed this up. And you would be wrong to think that because absolutely they would screw it up. But what would they probably do? Maybe they'd get, go and take a break and have a coffee or, you know, a beer or whatever. But then they'd go right back to it and say, okay, let's fix this. Like, oh, like, oh you dunderhead, just get back in it, you know. It's stubbornness. What is it? Uh, I listen. I was listening to a book the other day where I was talking about, you know, successful people and what they attribute their success to. And bullheadedness and stubbornness were definitely two of the things. They just, they weren't going to get down on themselves. They just turned around and tried again. And eventually they got it. So not giving up and not getting down on yourself. And understanding that you may not be like a super awesome painter right now, but you know what? If you keep practicing, you will be. So, yeah, I'm trying to get my right, my right, um, figuring out where my focus length is here. The old camera was focusing a little bit off. There we go. All right. So we've got that. And if we rotate it, you know, the uh, variations that we're seeing, oops, sword wants to fall off. Uh, the variations that we're seeing are uh, entirely from the folds and the tucks. And when we turn it flat to the camera, it looks pretty much right. We are a little close up here and I've got a little room on the other side. So I'm going to thin that down. Just take your time. There's no hurry. It's not a race. Just kind of get your standard pattern set and well set. And then we're going to have the, then the, the challenge comes with those horizontal bars. All right, so I trimmed that one up a little bit. It's a little bit tight up at the top, but I can I can allow, I can spread it on two sides a little bit. It'll be fine. Right. Yeah, it, exactly. What Anara said. Even the old masters like would screw up and just paint over what they did. Never be so invested in a piece that you don't want to change it if it's not working. Like. Sometimes it can be hard. Well, this is what we call in writing what they call murdering your darlings, right? You write a scene that you really like. And actually, I just did this the other day. Came to a scene in editing the second book um, where I really loved the scene. It was based on, you know, one of my favorite fairy tales. And uh, I really loved it. But I had to, like, look at it and say, this is too much. And it doesn't really fit the story. It's a nice little traips off to the side. It's kind of like Tom Bombadil. <laughs> it's, you're traipsing off to the side and it's fun. And it's written pretty well, but it doesn't serve where I'm going with the story. And it's adding another 4,000 words. And so I ended up chopping, chopping the whole thing. So if this is like, if I decide, even if I decided now, if I decided this tartan, not working, don't like it. I, I think it's not turning out the way I wanted to. I'm just going to repaint the back and put some freehand, some different freehand on it. I'm just going to put a lion head or I'm just going to put a, you know, a Celtic uh, swirl or something like that. You know, never be so invested in something that if you really isn't working, you can't see it or won't see it. Yeah, exactly, Val. I could do that. I could do a cool Celtic swear like that. That would be super easy. It would be much easier than doing the splat. <laughs> so yeah, totally. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Exercise is always, that's actually, it's what I tend to do too, except not, not the, um, the heavy bag Achilles, but I tend to take a walk. If I really have to iron something out in my head, I tend to take a walk. Oh, interesting. No, I'm not watching it. What network is it on in our, or what um, streaming service? Um, 8408 is the one that I prefer, Dragon. The reason is that it's much narrower. And since I use a lot of really thin paint, I get more mileage out of this. The other one's too thick for me. It holds too much. I even run into problems where this holds too much sometimes and I have to hold, I have to switch to a smaller brush. 
but I prefer the 8408. If you use thicker paint, you're going to get my, more mileage out of the 8404. If you use thin paint like me, you're probably going to get more mileage out of this. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting, Twisted Oma. That's, that's really cool. That's really cool. Do you remember the name of it, Twisted Oma? The name of that program? Because that's something I'd like to watch. And on PBS, I could probably find a way to stream it or something. All right, so let's try this again. And this time we're not going to have anything blocked in or anything at all. Oh, yeah. So maybe everybody loves the 8408. <laughs> I hope it's not that they're going to stop making it because that would make me sad. Um, all right, so let us take a chance. We're going to put a little bit more room this time between our stuff. And we're just going to do it one line at a time. On cable AMC. Oh, okay, that's the witch thing. Not offhand. Yeah, if you find it, let me know. Twisted Oma. It sounds like something I would go for. Being being an art geek. Oh, good, Agent Marvel. Glad you found one. Yeah, well, that makes me happy that I've got a backup. Um, I've got an eight, actually, I've got two backup 8408s. One is a zero and one is a one. Both fresh. Not even broken out of their tubules yet. Little do they know what's in store for them. <laughs> dear i'm kind of whimsical this morning a bit wacky one might say we are getting there huh we've got maybe 15 minutes all right so i'm gonna start widening out this stripe since i ran into problems with this last time i'm gonna do it stripe by stripe instead of tracing out a bunch of lines like i did last time i'm doing it level by level so that at every level if i need to i can push this stripe higher by moving my white up and putting some blue in that will let me correct when I see a problem right away. And right away what I'm running into is remember that curve that I said we were gonna hit. And I might even have to lower this stripe here a little bit on the other side. Um, because otherwise this is gonna curve and it's gonna go up as it goes across the cape. And although that's probably realistic, um, like tartans may not have been necessarily like kept even like when they made this cape, but uh, Blick ships to Canada? Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Blick is huge. They're in Chicago, aren't they? Like, where's their... I thought their HQ was in the Midwest, in which case it would make sense that they would ship to Canada. All right, so we're going to bring this over here. And we're going to keep this so that we've got nice big squares here. And then I'm going to maybe... I'm going to expand the top a little bit to give myself more room there we go now we've got a nice heavy stripe that looks a little better it's a nice thick stripe remember one of our problems last time was that a couple of our stripes were too thin and then it, things got so crowded we couldn't correct them so thicker stripe is good and remember i'm still going to put this dark blue edging around it so then it's going to shrink it just a little bit so Blick also has the best prices, so hopefully they do ship to Canada Goose. Because they can order in bulk, so they get the best pricing from. <sighs> yeah, I wonder what their size 2 would be like. I wonder if I could even use it. Like, the 1 is much larger than anything I've ever really painted with, like, consistently painted with. Guys, I think I'm gonna, I think I wanna slide this green line a little lower. I'm gonna bring my dark blue in and I'm gonna slide it down. Cause I just, I foresee a problem as we come in here. So all these little adjustments that you wanna make to make sure that you are as cool as you can be when it comes to the other side of this cloak because we're starting at an angle this is why because we're starting at an angle so it's naturally going to want to curve the design that we're doing and i don't necessarily want to curve i want it pretty flat through this area it can tilt a bit over here but i don't want it tilting through here like here it makes sense because it's being stretched out um 
Oh, I know, the post office. Hello, Aunt Moose. Welcome. We are screwing up our plaid and then having to repaint it. <laughs> That's what we're doing today. Uh, fake or fortune on PBS and... Ooh, I'll look, I'll look. Yeah, that would that would uh, that would uh, make sense because people find these paintings in their attics and uh, fortune PBS British show. I'm making all those notes. Thanks, thanks Twisted Oma. That sounds like a really fun show to watch. I bet David would like it too. I'm always on the lookout for shows that David and I both enjoy. Oh, official Ant Moose is rating with a party of one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the tiny raid. Tiny raids are just as good as regular raids. All right. Uh, so now, now that I've trimmed that down, I am going to actually try to carry this line over, this white line. Remember, the white line will turn green. I'm just using the white to map it out beforehand. And it'll make the green a little bit more crisp when we put it over. So I'm going to kind of start the line kind of in the middle of my previous, you see that? I'm going from the middle. And I'm leaving a lot of room here. And I want to make sure this line, when I go and look at it from a different angle, because right now I'm on the side. Now, when I turn it, what I really want to see is, is, is it's going more or less straight across. And what I'm seeing is that it maybe needs a little bit of correction over here. So let's do that. Let's actually like go from here. We've got this line down here. It's going to be over here. And I'm just going to quick sketch it in. And this paint is so thin and the line is so small that if I have to correct it later, if I have to like paint over it right after this with the blue, it'll cover it fine. It's so faint. But it's letting me map out these uh, horizontal lines, which are proving to be a lot more trouble than my verticals. There. All right. So now we want to look at it and say, all right, so we are getting a bit of an arc. But again, that's the way that this thing is going. So... It does make a little bit of sense. I think I've gone up a little bit too much here, although maybe not, because if I look here, if I look at the amount of space between this and this, it's pretty close. Like visually, I think maybe if I drop this line just a little bit, if I drop these lines like this side, just a little bit like this one. Um, in fact, I could even, if I wanted to be really persnickety, grab, do I have a tiny ruler? I thought I had a tiny ruler. I do, yay, a tiny ruler, come here. Tiny ruler, adorable. I could even measure. I could say, all right, so from the fur down to that line is one and uh, three fifths. And then from the fur down to that line here is actually the same distance. Like I actually nailed it, guys. So even though it looks like it's traveling in an arc, it's actually accurate. Like I managed to eyeball the distance precisely on both, both from here to there which is actually pretty cool. But, but this is, uh, yeah, and the shoulder on that side is higher too. Good point. Good point, Inara. Um, uh, we're very interesting around here. We are somewhat interesting. We're, we're educational at, uh... <laughs> thanks, Aunt Moose. Yeah, we're doing miniatures. So as you can see from my fingers, they're tiny. Uh, uh oh, we we hit some paint off of uh, that when we dropped her on the palette. Oh, well, we'll just have to adjust it. So since she's a little Highlander and she's got her little Claymore here, we are uh, doing tartan. And hey, thank you for the resub, Socrates. Awesome. Yeah, I do a lot of um, a paint, like paint technical stuff, uh, mechanical techniques, a lot of brushwork, and a lot of uh, color theory, Aunt Moose. That's, uh, that's my shtick because I, I actually created, I used to I used to work down in Texas for Reaper and for 17 years I worked there and created their paint line, MSP. So all of the paints that I'm using are actually formulas and colors that I created uh, and mixed for 17 years. I mixed almost every batch. So I like to share, essentially it gives you a certain level of uh, specialized knowledge about like the colors, the pigments, how they act, the paint viscosity, things like that, that not a lot of, show, of other painting shows talk about because they just... They don't have a person who actually created the stuff. Um, so yeah, I try to be educational on that level uh, fairly frequently. And color is my shtick. Uh, it's kind of the, the in, in art terms, that's what my free card was. I like have this, I just love color and it's the first thing I look at and, and I have a pretty good understanding of it. So I try to bring that to the show. 
Uh, so we talk a fair bit about color theory because it's intimidating to a lot of people who are starting out, especially in this hobby where in miniatures we get a lot of people who are coming from a gaming background, not an art background. So they come into this hobby and they really want to paint miniatures that look cool and they just don't have the foundation that somebody who grew up doing 2D art would. So I try to bridge that gap and make it accessible without getting too technical. Um, so that's kind of what my shtick is also. And of course this is a Reaper miniatures stream, so... Uh, I also have my own stream where we would do more D&D, although we do painting there as well. But, uh, but yeah, so that's what we're all about. All right, so I'm going to call, I'm going to call that accurate because as Anara pointed out, this shoulder is higher. Um, so having a little bit of an uptick, like an apparent uptick in the arc here, um, is not a bad thing. So I'm going to keep that intact as I move over here. And uh, I'm going to thicken out this line now a bit. I think I'm probably going to have to bring it up a little bit here because I see that it's spreading out a little bit. We'll see. We'll see how much it spreads out when we actually get over here. But this is an example when you're doing complicated freehand, just like when I was mapping out all the stuff on my sacrifice bust here with this crazy Moorish uh, design panel thing. You got to go slow. You got to be ready to change things. You got to be ready to do small adjustments um, <laughs> all while being awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I prefer, I don't like streamers who are into the all, we're all going to die way of, of streaming, right? I, they just increase my tension. Like contentious streamers just make me feel ee, and I don't like to feel ee. <laughs> my stream is under my, my sobriquet, which is painting big. Oh, hey, wait, I've got a painting big coaster. Painting big. There I am. Um, so uh, yeah, it's twitch.tv slash painting big. We do, we do a D and D and painting show. Um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, then my, my Patreon is also patreon.com slash painting big. I am, uh, since I no longer work for Reaper full time, since I moved out to be with my guy, um, this is actually my main form of income. So I really appreciate everybody's support. I am, in fact, a starving artist. Well, I'm a non-starving artist, really, because I'm doing well enough that we can, you know, buy tasty things. And I like to cook. We made ramen last night. Like real ramen, like I pressure cooked a pork shoulder. <laughs> yeah, what we do on my stream is uh, we paint the D&D characters while we roleplay them, Agent Marvel. Um, so we're working on painting our party. We have one model. We have our bard almost done. Which she's also a Reaper model. That's Zari. Zari and her dog Staccato. Um, who is based on my dog, Kiri, who just passed away right after Christmas. And then we have uh, Zandros, the priest, who we're trying to paint now. And then I just introduced... Uh-oh. As I sit here, waving my brush around and uh, painting all the things in my environment. <laughs> Sorry. My, my poor Unikitty just got a, uh, a large brush of green paint on her. And I'm sure she doesn't mind, but I do. Um, and then we've got our monk here that we're going to work on next. So, so yeah, we do that and we role play. It's a cooperative role play. So everybody in chat can get into it. We just have fun. I just missed having a game. Since, you know, I moved out here, got out of, away from my usual gaming group, which wouldn't have been able to meet anyway because of what's going on. Pandemic stuff. Uh, Okay, so we're going to thicken out those lines and try to make sure that we are close enough because these are widening out a little bit out here and I have to watch that. So even though this is accurate, I don't know if if it's going to be too far apart. Spacing on these horizontals are... Oh, it's on Netflix? Thanks, for it all. That's perfect. Yay. Oh, we're totally looking up. Net. Woohoo! Maybe we can watch the first episode tonight. That would be cool. David and I like to watch a little bit of something before bed, so. Otherwise, I don't watch much TV. Yeah, I would be doing glazes, Bo. You exactly hit it. Um. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a little tedious, but here, let me show you, Bo. Let me show you uh, the miniature I alluded to earlier, Juliana. 
So Julie, I did this same sort of thing on. So this is Juliana the herbalist. I did a stripey dress on her. Um, and I, I decided to map it out much like this. And so I, I started with just the blue and purple. And then I came back in with shading and highlighting on it. Um, and it worked out pretty well. And I didn't find it overly tedious. I mean, it looks like there's a lot of pattern here. But the reality is that once this is all blocked in, it's not going to be that hard. There are a lot of shadows, so then I won't have to worry about those areas once I put a darker glaze in them. And then highlighting specific areas is just a little bit of a touch. I mean, yeah, it'll take time, but it'll end up looking amazing. So, you know, I'm I'm okay with that. I you could I could have done. I, I talked a bit about this. I could have uh, highlighted and shaded the blue before I put the green down, right? But if I did that, then my blue would have been a lot closer to my green in shade. Like it would have been lighter in a lot of areas and it would have been harder to get that crisp line. So I really want to kind of be really selective about how I'm highlighting my blue in the end. Um, so it's a decision you make, right? Um, one way or another, uh, you just decide what's easier for you. But yeah, I will be glazing the shadows in because that's the easiest way to do it. It's just to take a darker color or a dark neutral and... Uh, or even a dark saturated. I could even use a purple to shade in if I wanted to, you know, depending on how crazy I want to be. Um, but yeah, I don't think that I'm going to have too much trouble with doing the highlights a lot. I mean, really, I just want to bring up the colors on places where the lights are really hitting. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it was tedious to like paint over all my little stitch work on my sacrifice bus too, but and most of that's done, most of that is, is starting top down, is start really light and glaze in. Um, and you could do that, actually, if you wanted to. I mean, one way to do this would have been to, to start very high and then glaze everything down. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's up to you, really. One way that I could do this, Bo, one, one probably the most, like, sanity-keeping way would be to just do the blue and green stuff without all the little fine little thing that I did over here because I wanted to see if it was going to work, which actually I think was necessary. But do all your blue and green stuff, then do your highlights and shading. Before you get into all of this little, you know, outlining all the stripes and making your light colors and trying to do your center stripe and all this other crap, just when it's just blue and green, that is probably the best time to do all your shading um, and to bring in highlights on your blue and green. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about it. And then when you come in with your little dark lines here, like this little finished, quote unquote, finished section, um, you're just going to go over what you did already and bring out your details. So that's probably the best way to, best being a kind of qualified best. It's possibly the least headache inducing way to do it. How about that? Hopefully that makes sense. Alternating green and blue and... Uh, well, yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was saying. That's why I would use a, a glaze for shadows. You just, you have the pattern and you just need everything to go darker. So you just may as well glaze. I do a lot of glazing on this show. Well, yeah, but I mean, for each green square, but like I was saying, if you only have your, like if you do your shading and highlighting when you're at this stage down here, where it's just um, intersecting bars of green and blue, I mean, yeah, it would be harder to do the blue. So maybe you want to do your blue highlighting after you do your verticals um, and then put your green in and then do your green highlighting when you've got those bars. You could do that. It's no, okay. No matter which way you do it, though, your highlights are going to be more tedious. <laughs> I don't see other than doing that, other than starting with your highlights and shadows or highlights, sorry, highlights on your blue to begin with. And then after you get your green grid in, just your grid uh, doing your highlights on your green that's, I think, the least sanity impairing method. I don't care. I'm just going to be painting. And for me, I kind of like the kind of repetitive um, highlighting thing. But it's up to you. Like how much it's uh, how to put it. One way saves time and is maybe a little bit more efficient. And the other way, um, I have to be more precise and it's a little bit more painstaking. It's going to take a little longer. It might, you know, drive some people to frustration. But for me, it's okay. I don't mind it. Um, I guess we could, we've already got a lot of stuff gridded in, but we could do, we could try that over here. But like I said, my main concern is that the blue highlights are going to bring this blue way up to where the green is as far as shade goes. And you're going to lose that crisp line. So that's my kind of my concern right now with bringing the blue up all over 
you know, or where the light would be like up on this fold and then trying to put green stripes up it uh, and making them stand out. Like I'd almost rather just go down with the blue, eh, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of, it's a lot of pain no matter what. <laughs> tartan is pain. Why do you think that it's legal to drink when you have painting tartan? Uh, this is, friends don't let friends paint drunk unless you're painting tartan, then we'll make an exception. Then pour yourself a glass of Irish whiskey <laughs> or Scottish, or scotch. <laughs> it's because this pattern is such a pain in the butt. Like if you're not just doing it flat and you want to highlight in shade and you want to do all that, well, shading is easy. It's glazing, but highlighting can be harder. So yeah. I don't know. I think I'll probably be so very selective on how I do my blue highlights. I'll mostly concentrate on green highlights and I have to do all of that before I try to put a thin stripe down it. All right, where am I? I don't know. I got lost. <laughs> oh, hey, it's already eight after 11. It's actually time to end. Well, we can, this is actually a good place to stop. Um, because we can continue with our mapping out next time and maybe even get through kind of all the everythings. Um, I could try to do some highlighting on the green before we, you know, get into more. I could try to do, as opposed to doing some highlighting and shading over here, um, we could kind of go back and forth and see how much, how we like it. Um, maybe I can manage to put the green over the top, even if I do highlight the blue. We might try that. We might try that. We'll try a whole bunch of things next time. But since we do a different model every day and since we have a six model rotation, our next model is going to be Dancing Girl. So tomorrow, or wait, or is it Sphinx? I think it's Sphinx. Yeah, tomorrow we're on Sphinx Wings, guys. So tune in tomorrow for our continuing saga of doo -doo -doo, painting Sphinx Wings. Remember we were working on, we set up our, uh, our wet blends and uh, started to pick out details on our top sides of our wings. We're going to continue with the patterning on these wings um, tomorrow. So Sphinxy is slowly, slowly progressing. So tomorrow is Sphinx Day. <laughs> cool. Alrighty, guys. Justin, do we have a raid? Yes, we're going to be raiding Mocha. Whoop, repeat that. You weren't in my ear. So we're going to be raiding Mocha. Oh, okay. Awesome. We haven't raided Mocha in a dog's age or a coon's age or a something small and furry and adorable's age. That's awesome. <laughs> Standard night out in Scotland. <laughs> Kernico, you're fun. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. I know some of you were new. It's nice to meet you. I hope you come back and hang out with us. And uh, yeah, tomorrow, Sphinx, Sphinx, Sphinx. So definitely don't miss it. Tune in later and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye. Don't forget our AMA this Friday. Thank you guys very much. I will see you later today.